Japan, the land of the rising sun, once the Asian superpower, and as recently as the 1980s, the land widely feared in the United States as heading towards becoming a world-beating economic superpower. But then the bubble burst, and Japan suffered first a decade and then a generation many called lost. What lies ahead for Japan? Is the sun still rising for the Japanese? Or do economic, demographic, and geopolitical challenges suggest more of a dusk than a dawn? This episode of The Whole Truth was made possible by Amatech, CNX, UGI Amerigas, SEI, Buchanan Ingersoll Rooney, and by For hundreds of years in English-speaking courtrooms around the world, People have sworn an oath to tell not only the truth, but rather the whole truth. The oath reflects the wisdom that failing to tell all of a story can be as effective as lying if your goal is to make facts support your point of view. In the courtroom, the search for truth also relies on advocates advancing firm, contradictory arguments and doing so with decorum. All of these apply to the court of public opinion, what John Stuart Mill called the marketplace of ideas. This series is a place in which the competing voices on the most important issues of our time are challenged and set into meaningful context so that viewers like you can decide for themselves the whole truth. In the 1980s, with a serious nonfiction work titled Japan as Number One becoming a bestseller, and with the radio filled with a catchy pop tune declaring that we were all turning Japanese, Americans were both fascinated and terrified by the emerging superpower they believed Japan to be. But something happened on the way to this predicted future. In the 1990s, Japan's economic bubble burst, and the country suffered a prolonged recession followed by an even longer period of historically slow growth, in which ultimately an entire generation of Japanese have now lived with diminished economic horizons and all the social consequences that accompany economic stagnation. At the same time, Japan's ticking demographic time bomb, a rapidly aging population destined to significantly decline in absolute numbers, given that birth rates are so low and immigration practically non-existent, presents the country with enormous long-term challenges. But both of these sets of difficulties may pale into insignificance compared to what has been happening next door to Japan while the island nation has been struggling since its Reagan-era apex. The mighty and meteoric rise of China fundamentally alters and threatens Japan's place in the world. All this being said, Japan remains the world's third largest economy and produces indispensable components to 21st century technology on which the whole world now fully depends. It remains a vibrant democracy and a place of both historic and contemporary cultural achievements. What lies ahead for Japan, for the Japanese people at home, for that nation's relationship with the United States and for its place in world affairs? Here with us today for this episode of The Whole Truth are Admiral Dennis Blair, former United States Director of National Intelligence and Chairman of the Board of Sasakawa. Uh, Sasakawa USA partnered with the World Affairs Council of Philadelphia in planning this episode of The Whole Truth. Thank you, Admiral. Uh, and welcome. Also here in our studio is Dr. Sheila Smith, Senior Fellow for Japan at the Council on Foreign Relations. And joining us by Skype from Japan is Kathy Matsui, Co-Head of Economics, Commodities and Strategy, and Chief uh, Japan Equity Strategist at Goldman Sachs Japan. Special thanks to you for doing this uh, in the middle of the night in Japan. Uh, thank you very much from uh, all of us. Uh, not long ago, I would say it was uh, Americans generally worried uh, about being economically and culturally overrun by an ascendant Japan. Uh, the idea of Japan as the world's new number one. But today, now in the wake of events both in Japan and the rap given the rapid ascendance of China, uh, Japan has been diminished uh, somewhat in American consciousness. So what's the big story here? Uh, has uh, Japan declined in some way or is this... Uh, 
uh, or is the East Asian story now this uh, rapid ascent of China, uh, or is it just simply a, a change in American perception and priorities, or in, in what combination? Admirals? Well, I'd say, uh, David, it's a combination of uh, many of those things. Uh, the Japan was on that ascent that you uh, talked about. We, we had books like, uh, Will Japan Take Over the World, and so on, back in the 70s and 80s. But about 1990, the Japanese uh, economy began to stagnate, a stagnation period which lasted about 20 years. In the middle of that time, I was the uh, commander-in-chief of the U.S. Pacific Command, and um, you could palpably feel the uh, passivity of Japan, the confusion. They just weren't ready to, um, they just weren't ready to take a role that was commensurate with the economic and the uh, political uh, uh, heft that they, that they had. Uh, I think the, the, the real story now is that uh, since uh, Prime Minister Abe has become the Prime Minister, and he bears a lot of personal credit for it, but not all of it. I think it's a general feeling in Japan that it's time to get on with uh, Japan playing a, a role in, in, the, uh, in the region, in the, in the world, that it's... Uh, its wealth and its its sophistication and its uh, influence uh, would uh, would uh, have it. And so, what you've seen really, what's been exciting, I think, is a uh, is a is a rebirth of Japan <laughs> moving forward. Now, that's important for the United States because uh, Japan is our single strongest uh, ally, certainly in East Asia, the increasingly the economic center of the world. But also, I would say it's our single. Uh, most important ally in, in the world right now. Uh, we tend to think of the NATO countries as a collective, but individually, Japan, Japan dwarfs them uh, in importance for the United States. We have uh, 50,000 of our troops uh, scheduled uh, uh, home base there with uh, ships and airplanes and, and a, third of, a third of the uh, Marine Corps. Japan shares our values. They're a mm -hmm. d democracy that uh, the United States had a hand in establishing after the after the World War II, and uh, but is, is is certainly Japan's own right right now. So J Japan believes in a free market economy and, and most of the things that we Americans uh, believe in. The cooperation between the United States and Japan is extremely important, natural, and will help uh, both countries, the peace in the region, and and really the uh, the future of the world. Sheila, what do you say? About that. that question of what the Japanese were doing right in the 1980s is an important one. And I, I, I remember being a graduate student going to Tokyo and being just the, the pulse of the city, the excitement of the Japanese economy. It was the place to be. It was thriving. Um, and I think there's also a sense when you were outside of, of Japan. I was in Paris at one point mm -hmm. and watching busloads of Japanese tourists arrive to buy Louis Vuitton bags and high-end mm -hmm. goods. The Japanese were a commercial success. They were a wealthy country. And a lot of Japanese were going abroad for the first time oh, as a work. result of that wealth. And oh. so the world was experiencing Japan's success in, a, in an immediate Maryland way. House on the uh, <coughs> JFK Highway. I yeah. mean, yeah, everybody yeah. be... <laughs> Japanese practically yeah. is, uh, is quite something. But I think also the uh, United States made a big deal out of the Japanese coming, as the Admiral said. Mm -hmm. There was lots of these books about you know the coming war with Japan. And, but Japan was this, the, the world's second largest economy. It was a success. And I think a lot of the American debate about itself in some way uh, was seen through the eyes of Japanese success. In other words, things like we don't have our education policy right. right. We don't have our manufacturing floor yeah, right. I think that's absolutely right. What is it we're not doing right? And so we, we were very reflective when we saw the yeah. Japanese success well, I in a way. remember as much as the Japanese are coming mm -hmm. uh, was, uh, as I would say, sort of a conscientious feeling that there's something that America can learn. Right, exactly, that uh, we can this, learn from them. You know, a lot of study, right? particularly. And there's, the, there's low crime in Japan. They're, they're, they've got a lot of things going on in Japanese society that we were struggling with, and we wanted to see what their, what their answers was. Another part of the story, though, is also Japan's emergence in multilateral institutions. Japan had belonged, of course, to the United Nations. It had belonged to the World Bank and the IMF. But it began to see these places as uh, opportunities to articulating the Japanese way of doing things. So you had the World Bank report that was about the, the miracle, right? The Japanese mm -hmm. miracle and how it informed other Asian economies, the ta Taiwan, Hong Kong, et cetera. There were these other societies in Asia that were coming along right. behind the Japanese. Uh, and the Japanese miracle in some ways informed the way they thought about the role of the state in the economy, for example, uh, about different kinds of emphasis on education and, and, and the kinds of things that are quite different from the way our society operates.
To what extent do you think that they may have influenced uh, China's modernization? A great deal. I mean, the Japanese from very early on wanted to help uh, the Chinese as they began they to did. articulate yeah, a move yeah. to a market economy. When Deng Xiaoping uh, was talking about the market economy that could help the Chinese develop over the longer term, it was the Japanese factories, the Japanese example that they were looking to at the time. Uh, Kathy, uh, uh, how, do, how does the miracle look, look from your vantage point, Goldman Sachs uh, in, in Tokyo? This, uh, uh, generally, what do you think happened uh, in the 80s and 90s? Uh, what is happening there today? Uh, uh, the Admiral has referred here to uh, sort of a recovery of a lawn and a recovery of momentum. Uh, what, what, what happened and what is happening there now? Uh, I remember coming here in 1989, and I come from the state of California, and they were saying at that point the value of the Imperial Palace that's sitting smack in the middle of downtown Tokyo was more than the state of California. Uh, at that point, the top 10 market capitalization companies in the world, eight were Japanese, of which five were Japanese banks. Mm -hmm. So, of course, what ensued after that was the party you know, cannot continue forever. Gravity uh, entered the scene. And the Bank of Japan had to start tightening uh, monetary conditions by raising interest rates. And of course, uh, this led to the deflation, prolonged deflation uh, era that we had really since 1990. And frankly, as an analyst sitting in Japan observing the economy for such a long period of time, I recall um, that remember, as asset prices deflate, uh, the entire process I just described unwinds, uh, then of course you end up with banks holding not good loans, but those loans turning sour. Uh, but the recognition process of those bad debts or those bad loans was, in my personal opinion, very slow. So Japan is back, so to speak. Uh, the American economy appears to be back uh, as well. So we've uh, uh, moved past this. Uh, looking prospectively, uh, where has this uh, long stagnation uh, in Japan, this long sideways uh, experience with the economy, where has that left them? And I, and I ask that in the context of uh, really impressive numbers that uh, I've been reading to prepare for this show. For instance, uh, uh, Japan is now a country of about 125 million. They expect to be 95 or under 100 million mm -hmm. uh, by 2050. Is that, is that possible? It's, uh, probably the number one headwind challenging um, the economy and the society today uh, which is the, the demographic uh, crisis, I call it. Um, frankly speaking, all the numbers you, yeah. you, you described are correct. Um, and a few years ago, we wrote a piece uh, talking about the demographic situation here. And I recall looking up a statistic, uh, which back then I think is still valid today, which is that there are more pets registered in this country than children under the age of 15. And I'm talking about registered cats and dogs, not hamsters and goldfish. So um, that kind of puts in a nutshell how uh, low the birth rate is and how rapidly this population is aging. So today, over a quarter of the Japanese population is already over the age of 65. Uh, in, you know, 50 plus years, that ratio will skyrocket uh, to about 40%. Admiral, you're, uh, you've done uh, national assessments and so forth. What does a 95 million population in Japan, say, uh, 30 years from now, portend geopolitically? Uh, can a, what, what kind of market share, what kind of an economy can a population that size, uh, compared to the one that they have now, uh, sustain? I think uh, the demographic challenge is, um, uh, doesn't... Uh, portend disaster for uh, Japanese ability to to have a uh, military and defense component of its um, of its uh, of its uh, overall uh, national national security approach but it uh, it's harder than if you had uh, a lot of uh, uh, a growing population Sheila, you spent a lot of time in Japan mm -hmm. you've uh, you've studied lived there and so forth what does uh, what does a decline like this mean culturally or psychologically uh, for, let, the, let for the Japanese, a, because so much, yeah. uh, I'm so struck by your, the idea that the Japanese stepped back right. uh, in the early 90s, that there is a sort of uh, a, a dizzying height that mm -hmm. they do not want to go beyond. That's a, that's a psychological turn, right. uh, which has a great impact on their economic performance and everything else. Now, what, what, what does a declining demographic do? 
So the, 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 there's two, there's one a very immediate result, which is, which is this is a much, much larger fiscal burden on the state. Social welfare and caring for the elderly is a, will, will pose a particularly uh, egregious problem for the Japanese government in terms of how it can afford to take care of that aging population. Um, the other is just, a, and this is a, a harder to prove with, with statistics and evidence, but let me just give you a, an anecdotal a glimpse that Japanese families today, um, they're largely, you know, seeing their elders um, not in their own homes, not being cared for in, mm. in, in extended family situations, right. but looking for caregiving outside the home in, in nursing care situations. And that produces its own burden on the household. But there's also the younger Japanese, and I'm thinking here of the 20 and 30-somethings, the generation to come, they largely feel that both partners will have to work. You know, so there's not an option anymore mm -hmm. of one of the uh, of the couple staying home, and that has also implications for child care. Admiral, I was struck by my, my comment you made that is uh, the adequacy of the Japanese uh, what are the self defense forces. Self defense forces. Yeah, the right. self defense forces uh, as far as uh, carrying out a naval mission. Now we have been reading a fair amount uh, in the states here about. Uh, uh, clashes between the Chinese and the Koreans and the Japanese over islands, uh, and sort of the expansion of China. That brings up the question of uh, Japanese-Chinese political relations, which you say lag right. behind uh, economic relations. Uh, is that chapter in world history behind us, uh, the great antagonism between these two? When we visited China uh, in 1975, my wife and I, Mao was still alive, mm -hmm. uh, that was the one topic which uh, was really uh, impolite to raise. I was asking anyone about anything that they had ever done or had uh, the contacts that they'd had with the Japanese. Right, right. Uh, where, where, where are we there? Uh, well, I think, uh, I think it's summed up in a, in a couple of things. The uh, Chinese talk about something called the first island chain, and they think that this is a natural barrier in the oceans to the east of uh, of uh, China, that they have a uh, that they have a natural right to have a great deal of sway and inf influence in, and the rest of the world calls that first island chain Korea, Japan, the Philippines, <laughs> and uh, in Indonesia, and and so what what's going on is that uh, China, uh, as it becomes more powerful, feels that it should have a wider sphere of uh, influence. It's uh, the buffer zones that it defines. Uh, as defensive around it, but look quite offensive to the countries who happen to live there, are should should naturally grow, and and, and this dynamic is what is um, is what is uh, going on with this expansion of uh, of uh, Chinese power, both economic, originally economic, and now um, military. Uh, is Japan? Um uh, they are a vital ally of the United States. Uh, we have grown up together over the last 60 or 70 years. Uh, we've interacted in a very amazing way uh, uh, and so on. But uh, are they, uh, is this a phase in their history? Uh, or, have the, or does the westernization apparent in Japan uh, mean something permanent there? Number one. And number two, adaptability. What kind of Japan is being discussed there right now. Uh, what might we see? What might take us by surprise in 25 or 30 years? So if you think about this pretty radical transformation of their attitudes towards what I would call more Anglo-Saxon definitions of capitalism, I think there has been a radical change. And if I might draw on what uh, was previously discussed with the Admiral on geopolitical issues facing Japan, a lot of people ask me, so why is Japan embracing things that are so un-Japanese like Anglo-Saxon modes of capitalism? I frankly would argue that one big reason is exactly what you pointed out earlier, which is the rising uh, power or geopolitical influence that of China. I think Japan has woken up and realized, oh my God, <laughs> this is a hegemonic power that could you know, take over all of East Asia and perhaps more. We better you know, get strong ourselves. But how can you be strong if your economy is in a coma, mired with deflation, stagnating growth-wise? You have to wake up. So I think part of this reality check, so to speak, has been driven uh, precisely by the rising power that is China. And I think going forward, when we're looking at, you know, some of the um, solutions that Japan is trying to pursue, I would actually argue that, for instance, 
because you're running out of people here, because they're very slow or loath to embrace, for example, you know, um, opening the, the, the gates to immigration here, what they have been doing is really upping the ante, so to speak, on technology development. So for instance, if you look at the use and development of robotics, of factory automation, uh, of artificial intelligence, it's really taken off. And it's interesting when I go back to the United States and we talk about this subject in various forms, there's an almost like, oh my God, robots are gonna take half our jobs, a real fear surrounding that topic. Well, here in Japan's context, it's not fear, but rather bring it on. <laughs> like we need to get automated. We need the robots like yesterday. You know, there are hotels here being completely run by robots. There are factories completely run by robots. You can't see a human being on the factory floor. It's pretty phenomenal. These problems that we've been discussing today are far more obvious to Japanese than anyone else. Uh, what kind of dialogue is there about them? Um, you know, the Japanese learned lessons coming out of World War II about the benefits of a global liberal order, one that the United States helped to shape and define and lead. Um, they have built their post-war success around many mm -hmm. of the ideas and norms and values and principles that we take for granted in this country. Um, should that liberal order be challenged, be it challenged by China? an authoritarian system with very different ways of thinking about the international order, or be it challenged by the American decision to step back from that leadership role, Japan will have some very difficult decisions to make. Um, and so that's why when we think about adaptability, there's, there's tweaking policy here and there mm -hmm. to deal with mm -hmm. concrete problems. But there's the larger, I think, for Japan existential question of what world our future Japanese going to live in and what role do we have in shaping that world? And they see that enterprise as very much a U.S. Mm. Japan enterprise. Very good. Very good. And I think it's very important that we remember that. So Admiral, from the, from the perspective of uh, American international global strategy over the next, uh, mm -hmm. over the coming decades, uh, what, what planning assumptions are you making about uh, the Japanese? Mm. Well, when you, when I add it up, if the United States and Japan stay uh, together and and we we keep um, we keep uh, in a sensible way increasing our military capability as technology and resources uh, uh, come into it. Then we can continue to make uh, military aggression uh, very high risk for China or anybody or anybody else. Uh, the the actual issues uh, that. You could imagine leading to conflict in that region are all around islands and uh, uh, stretching from the the north northern territories north of Japan all the way down through the South China South China Seas and uh, those it's a uh, it's a difficult business to uh, to take and hold an, an island and uh, and with the United States and Japan having uh, a, a good solid uh, military and air capability then. Uh, China or any other aggressor would have to think of other other ways to get ahead, and that turns it back, I think, into a competition of economic uh, performance and of values. Uh, what kind of a country do you want to live in? Do you want to live in a country that has its internet censored and its uh, right. and its uh, you know, if uh, lawyers uh, become too uppity, they get taken away and put in put in jail, and and bloggers are brought in for. Uh, ed education, or do you want to live in a in a country that uh, in, in which the courts are independent, the uh, the the press is uh, pretty free, and uh, people can move around? Now the bargain that the uh, Chinese government has uh, struck with its people is: uh, we'll we'll give you good economic goods, but you just uh, leave the political side to us. Uh, for all the years of stagnation uh, that we've uh, spoken of today. Uh, perhaps uh, challenges facing Japan in the future. One of the greatest stories of my life, certainly, uh, has been the rise of this nation. Yeah. Uh, from what it was when I was uh, eight or nine years old, and, and uh, in fact, we were in school together in Northern Virginia, uh, thinking of uh, of, uh, of the Japanese and, and that war just just passed. This is one of the great stories uh, of my lifetime, our lifetimes, uh, and. Uh, Truly enjoyed reviewing uh, it with uh, you all today. Thank you very much. Enjoyed it. Good. Thanks, David. Good. As we've discussed with our panel, Japan today faces significant challenges both at home and in terms of its place in the world. The demographics pointing towards a decline in Japanese population in this century, back to levels from before the Second World War, pose unprecedented questions for Japan. 
Likewise, the rise of China reverses two centuries in which the Japanese were the dominant Asian nation. The whole truth of this matter, however, as I see it, is that no nation in the world has demonstrated a greater degree of adaptability than the Japanese. The rapid adoption of Western technologies and the institutions in the century before World War II made them one of the most powerful nations in the world, and their amazing renaissance after World War II is one of the great success stories of all time. One cannot say with certainty what lies ahead, but one can say with great confidence that Japanese resilience and determination are likely equal to the challenges. I am David Eisenhower. Thank you for watching The Whole Truth. This episode of The Whole Truth was made possible by Amatech, CNX, UGI Amerigas, SEI, Buchanan Ingersoll Rooney, and by 